So good afternoon, everyone, or good early evening. Um, I would like to start with an acknowledgement um, of country. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're all um, sitting or standing. Um, and for me, that is the Wajak Noongar people um, over in WA. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to um, leaders past, present and emerging. Um, so welcome to this AMSI public lecture as part of the BioInfo Summer um, Seminar or Summer School. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Aaron Jex, um, who is based at the um, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. He leads an infectious disease research laboratory there and um, has worked with the Victorian water industry over the past 15 years or more with a focus on molecular-based diagnostics and systems biology-based studies of cryptosporidium, giardia, half or algae, and of course, of uh, most interest to us at the moment, um, SARS-CoV-2. He's um, played a key role in um, programs through the evaluation of PCR-based diagnostics, development of novel tools to verify positive test results and the implementation of programs. His team are now developing methods to support wastewater-based detection of high-risk SARS-CoV-2 variants and whole genomic sequencing methods to assist community tracing, um, which of course translates into how to find COVID through um, sewerage. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Aaron to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks very much, uh, uh, Nicola, and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and present. Um, I hope everyone is having a, a nice afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the country. Um, so. Uh, as Nicholas said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lab head uh, and an associate professor at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute and also within the veterinary faculty at the University of Melbourne. Um, and my research team specializes in infectious disease. Um, we do a lot of work on trying to understand the basic mechanisms through which infectious organisms, particularly parasites, uh, manage to cause infections, how they survive, how they become resistant to drugs, uh, how to develop new methods to treat against them, uh, how they interact with the host and a whole range of other different, um, different research areas. Um, and a lot of that work involves many of the things you may have been hearing about over the last few days within the informatics seminars, genome sequencing, looking at uh, trying to understand these organisms at a whole cell or a whole organism or a whole system level, uh, and a lot of intensive computational biology. I've also worked for a number of years within the water industry. Um, and, and this program that I'm going to talk about today kind of represents, I guess, a blending of both of those interests. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on the overall program and how wastewater testing programs work, uh, but you'll see as we go through a number of different ways in which computational biology, genomics, and a variety of different methods uh, play such a key role in um, a number of different efforts, including ours, to try and assist with, with helping to curb this pandemic. And, and, and we'll touch on those briefly. I'll try and keep it uh, fairly light in terms of the technical aspects, but of course, there'll be time uh, during questions, if, you, if you'd like more information on, on some of that. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll just do my share screen. And bring the presentation on. There we go. Okay. So one of the things with SARS-CoV-2 that made it quite an interesting um, organism to work with, an interesting virus, is uh, it has the ability to be shed. It's of course a parasite or a, parasite, a virus that uh, infects the lungs and causes respiratory distress and, and, and disease. Um, but it is able to pass it through the intestinal tract and be shed in feces. There's some uh, discussion around whether it may possibly infect the intestinal tract. Irrespective of, of whether it does or not, um, you can detect shed virus in fecal material for many weeks after uh, the um, infection has passed, after there's no longer respiratory signs. Um, and, um, and you can potentially use that information for diagnostics. And so this kind of led to a question uh, which arose fairly early on in the pandemic, which was if you could detect SARS in fecal um, samples, could you do surveillance of wastewater and sewage systems as a way to identify viral transmission um, before it shows up at the clinic or to supplement clinical testing and, and through that have a better understanding of the spread of virus and potentially try and, and, and minimize or mitigate that spread? Now, wastewater testing is, is a program that has actually been around in some capacities for quite an extended period of time. 
Um, most broadly, some examples include active programs that look for um, illegal drug use in wastewater testing. Uh, in Australia, there are some examples of these programs that are run through Queensland. At this stage in Australia, these aren't used for law enforcement purposes, but rather for um, understanding usage, basically like health demographics, trying to get an understanding of how common illicit drug use is, what the major problem drugs are, and those sorts of things. Um, for monitoring for an invasive or, or infectious pathogens, there's some research globally and, and emerging within Australia as well of using wastewater monitoring to detect for antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance genes. One of the big programs that's been running for several decades now has been to, to do wastewater surveillance for the poliovirus as part of global poliovirus eradication programs. And that's probably the most well spread or, or widespread and, and well-documented use of this, of this sort of method. And there are additional programs that have looked at testing for things like hepatitis, various hepatitis viruses, rotavirus, and so on, and trying to understand whether the levels of virus that's detected in the wastewater system itself tracks well with the prevalence of infections in the community and can be used as an indicator of the prevalence of infections in the community. And this is kind of an example graphic with um, a study that was done on influenza viruses. It looked at tracking viral detection rates with case rates and, and showing how they kind of lined up. So as I said, polio is a good test case. This is the most widely, widely used version of the program, or at least it was up until SARS-CoV-2 came along. Um, and that's been quite well taken up through, w, uh, through World Health Organization programs across uh, uh, a number of countries around the world, including in Australia, where it gets routinely done by um, research groups at the, at the Peter Doherty Institute of Infectious Disease. Um, it allows the rapid identification of trace levels of the virus. It also allows differentiation from um, an attenuated or a, a non-pathogenic version of the virus that's used in um, vaccines. Um, and, and this really gives a handle on trying to identify uh, minor or small remaining residual focal points of community infection of this virus, um, as I said, in the, in the approaching efforts to ultimately completely eradicate polio as a, as a human disease. So early on in the pandemic, these questions arose, well, okay, could, could, could you use wastewater detection to identify SARS-CoV-2 um, in the community? Does it reflect clinical, clinical case data? Can it be used to overcome gaps in that clinical testing? Can it be used as an early warning system to identify new clusters of infections before they spread? Um, as I'm sure all of us will appreciate over the, the, the course of this pandemic, the faster that you can slow the momentum of transmission of this virus, uh, the vastly easier it is to try and limit its spread and prevent major consequences like major lockdowns or uh, significant disease and, 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 uh, and deaths and, and so on. So can, can wastewater testing give us that early insight, that early warning system to try and mitigate and limit that spread? And how can it be built into supporting the public health system and be used? So there was an initial study published by a group from the Netherlands led by um, an author, uh, Medima, and that looked at trying to develop clinical tests or repurpose tests from clinical sciences for SARS-CoV-2 and use them for testing in wastewater using a technique called uh, RTQ-PCR. This is a method that amplifies a diagnostic region of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 or, or whatever you want, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA genome, and then uses various different analytical uh, methods to identify and match that piece of genome that's been amplified and verify that, it's, that it belongs to this specific virus. So in those preliminary studies, they showed that indeed, as they, if they matched up the testing that they did in the wastewater systems with what they knew about clinical case rates as COVID emerged within the Netherlands, that they could indeed get, uh, that the numbers did sort of quantitatively track. So here, for example, is an estimate of the amount of viruses, we, we use the term gene copies per milliliter, per mill of, of, of raw wastewater, gene copies relating to the targeted region of the virus. Um, and, and the reason you use that distinction as opposed to just calling it viruses per mill is because you're identifying a portion of the genome. You can't be certain it came from an intact virus, although the chances are high that it does. Um, and then they also looked at when they could start to detect it relative to their earliest known cases. And they were able to show within their initial study that they could get a detection of um, the virus even in the early stages of the pandemic as it spread to the Netherlands, when according to their clinical case data, they had a, a community prevalence of less than one infected person per 100,000 people. So, so showing an extreme level of sensitivity, even right at the very start of the program. 
these programs then expanded and a number of research groups around the world have, have published a variety of different studies, again, asking these questions about how wastewater detection tracks with community case rates and, and, and gaining sort of insight and information into whether it could be used as a, as a basically as a, as a proxy for understanding what's happening in the community. And among other things that they showed is that you got a lag between when viruses were showing up in the wastewater versus when you would see spikes in clinical cases. And on average, that was a period of about four days. So basically the take home message here was that wastewater detection could give you an up to four day lead time uh, indicator of a, of a cluster emerging within the community. And then various other studies looked at ways to optimize that and looked at, um, again, trying to refine understanding how to link the levels of virus material they were detecting with, um, with the number of cases in the community. And around March of 2020, um, there was a program developed within uh, Australia called the Colossus Project. This stands for Collaboration on Sewage Surveillance of SARS-CoV-2. This is led by a large research organization called Water Research Australia. Water Research Australia is uh, the funding body that oversees uh, a lot of water industry uh, research programs and kind of coordinates funding between different water authorities and, and other um, uh, potential funding partners that have an interest in the water industry. And that basically brought in a number of different state-based programs across in initial stages, Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, and New Zealand. Um, there are now programs in West Australia and Northern Territory um, and Tasmania as well. The program was overall run through uh, Water Array uh, by Kelly Hill and Dan Deer. Um, and then within the Victorian node that I'm a part of, um, that program is administered through the Victorian Department of Health. And that program kind of proceeded through a number of different phases. Firstly, initiating the program, uh, then developing the, the capacity to do the testing, working out how to integrate it into the public health system, how to understand it, make use of it, um, and then eventually implementing it into a routine system. And at first glance, it, it might sound relatively straightforward to do this. I mean, if you look at conceptually how a wastewater detection program might work, you have at some at some level a source of wastewater that could be the influent of a waste of a wastewater treatment plant. That's been a, a big part of the program in the early days. It could also be on a more local scale where you're looking at um, sewage outflow from a hospital or a quarantine hotel or an aged care facility that definitely became part of the program later on, and it could even go as fine scale as looking at individual dwellings um, if you had the um, uh, desire and the means to do so. Samples get collected, they get transported to a lab, they get uh, the viral particles get um, purified from the sample and concentrated, the RNA gets removed and then amplified in one of these diagnostic tests. In practice, setting up this program was both really interesting, but also um, extremely challenging for a number of reasons that would up until an experience with a pandemic never have occurred to me. So first and foremost, the obvious obstacles were that we were dealing with a new virus. There were no developed protocols or diagnostic tests for identifying it. There were no methods that were widely tested for um, purifying the virus from wastewater and these different things. Uh, no way to know whether the methods that were being repurposed from clinical testing were going to be specific for the virus in wastewater, because wastewater obviously contains a lot of other things besides just viruses and just the coronavirus to be specific. And we didn't know how any of this would work. Um, in addition to that, we had in Australia for the vast bulk of the pandemic, the very good fortune of having extremely low rates of community cases of, uh, of, of COVID um, and therefore very low levels of the virus in wastewater. And so for much of the time, we were, we were really trying to push these diagnostic tools past a level of sensitivity that just about any other uh, region of the world needed to do. And that always presents some quite significant challenges in terms of how, how these methods work. Then there were just practical limitations. As the pandemic picked up speed, there was an enormous demand globally for a lot of the basic lab reagents that you need. The filters, for example, you need to remove the virus from the wastewater or the diagnostic tests you need are basic reagents for the lab. And you were competing with just about everyone else in the world uh, to try and get access to this material. And we had this challenge because it wasn't just a research question that we were interested theoretically in seeing if this would work. This was something that we needed immediately for part of the public health response. And so if we had a, a potential option that was a good method to use, but it was going to take us three or four months just to get the filters in the country to be able to do it, then we simply couldn't use that approach. So a lot of the work in the early stages was trying to kind of find just a practical method that would work, that uh, could be used reproducibly and, 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 and in a wide scale. 
but also that we could just physically get our hands on the material that we needed to be able to do this, which was really an unusual type of situation. So the kind of analogy that I use is often the analogy about, um, about trying to, to build the plane while you fly it. I kind of link, liken this analogy to trying to build the plane while it's plumbing out of the sky. So a really interesting challenge um, and, and, and also a really fantastic program to be a part of from the perspective that it was, from my perspective, science at its absolute best. You had groups from all over the country. They weren't worrying about their intellectual property. They weren't worrying about publications. They weren't worrying about trying to claim status on developing these methods. They were just working together all across the world uh, through social media, through conferences, through workshops to just share as quickly as they could what they knew and how they could get these programs to work. And that's how science should work. Oftentimes, to be honest, it's not how science does work. So it was really fantastic to be a part of that. In terms of how we got this to work, um, we ended up going with, uh, and this was done through ultimately in Victoria through a commercial service provider called ALS, which has a long history, Australian Laboratory Services, a long history of um, doing diagnostic testing for the water industry. Uh, they uh, used a commercial method developed through a company called Perkin Elmer. Um, it's again, one of these uh, RTQ PCR methods. They repurposed uh, a method that was developed um, uh, by a CSIRO to uh, filter the viruses with high level of sensitivity and specificity out of wastewater, um, and then got the test up and running and actually ended up with a, with a diagnostic test that was extremely sensitive. The diagnostic test targets a couple different regions of the viral genome, targets something called the nucleocapsid gene. This is a gene that basically makes the outer shell of the virus uh, uh, surface, and then targeted a region called ORF1AB, which has uh, I think an unknown function at this point, but, but is useful for diagnostics. One of the challenges we face is this method was developed again for clinical testing and, and Perkin Elmer, the company that developed it, had tested it against um, a panel of normal respiratory viruses that cause human infections. But we were applying this in a, in a wastewater environment that could have a whole range of other things, bacterial sources, other viruses, potentially animal viruses. Um, and so one of the big questions was, okay, you can, you can detect these gene fragments in wastewater, but how do you know that it's actually the virus that you're looking for? And so that's a big part of where my team specifically came into this program. And our job, one of our jobs was to try and develop methods that would allow us to independently verify that the virus was present, to basically take those gene fragments that the, that the diagnostic kit that ALS was using um, and then barcoding them to identify and confirm that they were from the virus. We used a couple of different approaches for that. We used a sequencing method uh, that allowed us to basically uh, determine the complete sequence of those little fragments and then match them back to uh, the original reference genomes for the viruses and, and, and show that they, they matched up. And that was a nice method to use. It confirms the presence of the virus. The downside of this approach is it takes 12 to 48 hours turnaround time. And when you're dealing with public health responses where you know, there's a new cluster or a new detection in, in some uh, region of the state where we don't know there's any community cases, waiting 48 hours to get confirmation of those results before the Department of Health can act is a problem. So we also worked on a really cool system that I'll touch on a little bit called the CRISPR system, which allowed us to detect and confirm the presence and the identity of these, of these uh, diagnostic uh, fragments in a couple of hours, which meant that if we received a sample in the morning, by the afternoon, we could report confirmation of the identity of the virus back to the Department of Health, and then they could make decisions on how to act on that. These methods work through a couple of different approaches. So the, the amplicon sequencing approach, I don't want to go too much into the nitty gritty details of this, but basically you're um, uh, putting some um, uh, standardizing the ends of, the, of these little RNA fragments with some uh, labs or uh, assay specific um, uh, additions and then you're sequencing that, then you're matching up those, um, those sequences to the, um, to the virus genome and using that to identify and confirm the presence of the virus. The CRISPR assay is pretty cool. So CRISPR, I don't know how much uh, uh, people in the audience have, have heard of the CRISPR system. Uh, it's beginning to become quite well known in, in, in sort of popular science and popular literature because of its uh, phenomenal potential. It was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, for um, medicine not that long ago. This is a method that's repurposing an enzyme that's actually part of the immune system or sort of rudimentary immune system of bacteria that they use to defend themselves against viruses. And the way this enzyme works is it identifies little fragments of sequence that, that in the natural system bacteria encode in spacers between their genomes or between their genes. 
And then when it identifies those little fragments, it, it, it uh, cuts them in um, with the enzyme and breaks them. So basically the idea here is that it remembers viruses uh, that it's encountered in the past. Those get little fragments get encoded in its genome. And then it produces these little hairpin structures called guide RNAs that float around in the cell. When they find a viral uh, sequence that matches up, the enzyme breaks that virus down and destroys it, and then it can't replicate. We can artificially repurpose that, and in diagnostics, so this is used, for example, in, in, as a really exciting technology, in, for example, gene therapy and repairing genes. Um, but in our case, for diagnostics, you can also use it. The way this works is you've got, again, your fragment. This is the same fragment that the PCR I mentioned that ALS is using amplifies. And then we design a little probe, and that probe has the same sequence as a region of the fragment and a little fluorescent dye. And then what happens is that the uh, CRISPR enzyme identifies the region using a, a, a guide RNA that we've designed to target that region, identifies it, begins to digest it. And as it does that, it breaks down the little fluorescent reporter. And then we see this increase in fluorescent signal on uh, a, a, a machine that'll read, basically just read that for us. It's just something that detects fluorescent light in that channel, that wavelength. And so by doing that, you can rapidly confirm the presence of that, of that fragment and confirm that it matches the sequence of the virus you're interested in. And that happens within a process that takes, as I said, a couple of hours. So from there, the program moved into implementation phase. The diagnostic methods worked. We showed that the method was that the method being used by LS was highly sensitive. We had a means to confirm the presence of the virus and confirm that these were positive samples, and then we could start to use it. And then the next question was, well, how does the Department of Health make use of that information? And by now, I, I imagine that many of you will have seen reports in the news of wastewater detections of viral fragments and things like that. There's a variety of different ways the Victorian Department of Health used this system, in part it was being used as an early detection and warning system. Um, it was used to help uh, inform the public health, uh, or sorry, the general public about the, the, the potential presence of virus in the community uh, to prompt people to go and get tested if they had uh, symptoms that were associated with COVID. Um, even in some instances, in some of the regional areas of Victoria, for example, down in um, Apollo Bay, uh, sometimes sort of, um, what was this, uh, early last year, uh, you had pop-up detections of, of, of virus in the Apollo Bay that turned out to be um, linked to a, a cluster in a meatpacking plant that was just outside of Apollo Bay. And what that did is it prompted the Department of Health to then put uh, pop-up testing centers within the Apollo Bay region. There were some other examples around regional Victoria where this happened in, in 2020 um, and do sort of more broad scale and focused testing. Um, and then use that information to try and, and, and again, reduce the spread in the community. So as we look more broadly at the overall program, um, we've tested many thousands of samples now and the program expanded. It now covers within Victoria, um, it covers about 140 different sampling sites across the state. This includes all wastewater treatment plants in the state and a number of sites within the metropolitan area, including as, as examples, hotels and hospitals and things like that that I mentioned. Um, it's uh, over the course of testing, we've had many hundred samples that have tested positive. Um, with the genetic methods that we use, we've shown that all of those positive detections, pretty much without exception, were genuine, correct detections and were indeed the virus. And it's played an active role in identifying numerous unknown community clusters within Victoria. I think now there's well over 15 instances over the past 18 months where, um, where wastewater detecting, uh, wastewater based um, testing has been the first indication of a growing cluster either within the, the metropolitan Melbourne area or uh, within regional Victoria that, that, that then resulted in the detection of, of clinical cases that had not been previously identified. And that gives a lead in time to allow the Department of Health to limit spread and to reduce the overall size of the, um, of the cluster and, and potentially avoid things like lockdowns and, and obviously um, disease and so on. There's a website Department of Health manages that does real-time daily updates on the um, testing that happens across the state. You can go and look at them. Um, you can look at individual suburbs. You can see and track over the sort of last 28 days, all the testing has been conducted there. Um, one of the really cool uh, elements of the program that led to a lot of the utility of this method uh, and, and really made this a powerful tool for public health was um, developed by an associate professor at Monash University, Dave McCarthy. And Dave McCarthy developed um, this passive sampling device. It's a, it's a little absorptive sponge that sits in a 3D, pin, uh, uh, 3D um, printed plastic housing. 
that you can suspend into sewage outflow systems. And the beauty of this system is that it allows you to not just deal with um, trying to test for the virus in large catchments so for, or in large treatment plants. So for example, in Melbourne, the two major treatment plants that service nearly all of Melbourne are the Western and Eastern treatment plants, the Western treatment plant out here in, in kind of the Werribee area and the Eastern treatment plant down towards Frankston. And these service, so the Western treatment plant covers about one and a half million people across the entire Western suburbs of the city. And the Eastern treatment plant covers about two and a half million people across the entire Eastern suburbs. So from a practical purpose, you have a positive detection at the Eastern treatment plant. How useful is it? Because you can't exactly tell two and a half million people that there might be virus circulating somewhere in their community. That's not going to be very powerful. So by allow, by being able to then work within the network by using these passive portable and disposable samplers, you could now break up the metropolitan area into many different sampling sites. You could put these passive samplers outside of quarantine hotels, and aged care facilities, and indeed they've been used for exactly that. Um, this is really fantastic. Dave's made this freely available online uh, and it's being used now across the world. The US military is using this for a variety of different things. It's being used in Europe, it's being used in North America. It's really become an important tool globally in the wastewater program. And, and it's all through the ingenuity of, of, of Dave and inventing it. He even came up with a nice name for it. He calls it the, Puto, the, uh, the Torpudo, um, but maybe there will be a better name for it when, we start, when he starts developing the way it is, perhaps. Okay, so from there, I want to talk a little bit about um, the next phases of the program that are currently happening. And, and here you really start to see a lot of how we rely on genomic information uh, and, um, and computational biology within this program. So as you well know, I'm sure, um, as the pandemic has progressed, a number of different viral mutations have evolved and eventually given rise to a number of different viral strains and lineages that have success over successional periods become the dominant strain circulating within uh, the, the global community. Uh, the United States, uh, US CDC, and also the World Health Organization developed this system of classification where they talk about variants of interest, variants of concern, and so on, based on um, the emergence of these variants, their potential to have um, a pathogenic or uh, effect or to escape the immune response, um, their rapid emergence as focal clusters, and then eventually their confirmed uh, effect in widespread transmission. And then there's this final group called variants of high consequence, which are those variants of concern that emerge that are able to uh, escape diagnostics and potentially cause treatment failures. At present, there are uh, five currently recognized variants of concern. The most recent one, of course, is the Omicron variant. There are fortunately no currently classified, what we refer to as variants of high consequence, no confirmed viral variants that are able to escape treatment or diagnostics at this stage. Although obviously that's one of the questions that, that, that groups are furiously asking about Omicron. There's a database uh, developed called Next Strain, which compiles um, all of the genomic information that's made available for these uh, viral genomes as they get sequenced um, and put into the public domain. And they've developed a system that allows them to classify these viruses into strains and lineages, and that's used to help to identify these new viral variants as they emerge. There's another um, another similar database called Pangolin uh, that also uh, helps with this sort of classification. Okay, so if we look at the emergence of variants of concern, one of the big things is these mutations that are relevant when it comes to transmission or vaccine escape or antibody escape, they all mostly center around uh, a particular region of the, of the viral genome that encodes something called spike protein. Spike protein is the protein that's on the surface of the virus. And spike protein is what binds to and interacts with a, a receptor on our cell surface called ACE2. ACE2 is involved in regulating blood pressure within, within our bodies. But the virus uses this, the spike protein fits like a key inside the ACE2 lock, and that's how the virus gains entry into our cells. Mutations that happen within a region called the receptor binding motif, RBM, are also referred to as the receptor binding domain, RBD, same thing. These mutations basically seem to, at least the ones that are advantageous, change slightly the shape of spike protein and make it just that little bit better able to bind to our receptor or activate the receptor and gain, and gain infection of the cell more rapidly. And that's led to the increased transmissive capacity of some of these variants, as well as potentially some aspects of their increased ability to cause disease, like for example, the Delta variant. Other mutations that can occur within a region called the N-terminal domain, or NTD, it's down around here uh, roughly, 
These mutations are also associated with where a lot of the antibodies that are raised against the spike protein and, and most of the vaccines um, certainly all the widespread vaccines like the Pfizer uh, and Moderna and um, AstraZeneca vaccines and so on are all developing an immune response largely against spike protein, not just based on antibodies, but largely against spike protein. And so mutations that allow the protein to, to potentially reshape in a way that makes them no longer recognizable by the antibodies that, that our body's producing, either as a consequence of having already been infected by the virus or having been vaccinated, may potentially reduce the uh, protection, the immunity against this virus, and may mean increased infections and so on. So that's kind of where people are looking for mutations that are relevant when it comes to increased risk with these things. Just realized that I'm rapidly moving through my time, so I want to keep pressing ahead. A number of different mutations of these different variants within spike protein allow us to classify them. We can then go and look for them using diagnostic tools. And that's basically what we started to do. There are a variety of different approaches that we use for that. Um, two of them that I'll focus on here are a method that allows us to amplify and sequence the regions of the spike protein that are most associated with this increased transmissive capability and increased uh, risk of, vac of vaccine or immune escape. And then another method, which is a, 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 or sort of a variation on the same theme with these CRISPR assays where we use fluorescent probes. In this case, a slightly different approach called CRISPR-Sherlock, which allows us not only to identify um, the, um, the PCR fragment that's present uh, and amplified from the virus, but also gives us two different probes, one that has a mutation that's associated with the, one of the variants versus one that doesn't, and we can identify and differentiate between mutated and, and non-mutated viruses, and, and that allows us to start classifying the viruses into different variants. We've developed a variety of different approaches. Um, these are at various different stages of development. Some of them have been abandoned along the way because they're mutations that were associated with viral variants that were important six months ago, but the virus moves so quickly that now they're really no longer uh, considered to be a, a, a significant issue. Most of the work up until five days ago shows how fast things change. It was focused really on, on mutations like this uh, mutation here. Um, this labeling here has to do with uh, the, the, the 474 number is the position in the spike protein where the mutation occurs. And then the, the, the letters indicates what the, the sequence at that position was uh, before the mutation and then what it becomes after the mutation. And this is just the annotation system that allows us to identify these mutations. So this one here is one that was particularly unique to and associated with the Delta variant. And so that's the one that we've developed up most and that's through now to, to implementation phase uh, and being used. And we're currently developing assays for, um, for uh, Omicron. So Omicron, I, I've got this little gift that came up, which is, this is one of these bizarre things that happen. So on Thursday, it shows again how fast things change. So on Thursday, I had a meeting with, um, with uh, the Department of Health and we were talking about rolling out this variant detection system and how it would be used. And they were asking me to kind of give them an update on uh, my understanding of, of, of kind of the current situation for, um, for the spread of these high-risk variants around the world. Um, and, I, and I said, you know, exactly these words, basically, because at that point, as far as we knew, it was all just the Delta variant and maybe a little bit of this new variant called Delta Plus. But, but I, I sort of used the expression that it's quiet and perhaps maybe a little too quiet. And then six hours later, I saw an article in the news about this new variant that was emerging in South Africa. And that's, of course, the Omicron variant. And, uh, and then within, you know, 24 hours after that, you know, everything got turned on its head. So it shows how quickly some of these things can change. So, of course, you, I'm sure you will all have heard about this new variant, the Omicron variant. And, of course, there's a lot yet that's not known about this variant, including, you know, truly speaking, how rapidly it spreads. That's still not determined whether or not it causes increased disease or even whether it's significantly uh, pathogenic at all. And of course, one of the big questions, which is whether or not it can uh, be resilient to vaccination or, or at least be more resilient to vaccination. And a lot of that centers around just this incredible emergence of a large number of mutations within the spike protein at, at really an unprecedented rate compared to what we've seen with other variants as they've changed. But as I said, there's a, there's a heck of a lot that still isn't known about this variant. So we looked through the, the spike protein and in particular at the regions that I mentioned that were potentially associated with, with immune escape. This isn't, of course, the only region that can mutate and lead to potential immune escape, but this is one where things tend to concentrate. Um, and there are a variety of different mutations in the Omicron variant that are, allow it to be differentiated from, um, from the, uh, 
uh, from the other variants and the other viruses that are currently circulating. And we can amplify this using this um, PCR approach and then sequence this region. In addition to that, we've looked at the region that's associated with this uh, receptor binding domain, the part that allows the, the, the virus to gain entry into our cells. And there are quite a number of mutations that are unique, at least so far, to the Omicron variant that, again, we can target uh, with our diagnostic tools. Sorry, something happened with my, with my font formatting that just says increased transmission there if the text is blocked. So we're in the process now of working these tools up, and we've used them quite broadly. We've used these, um, uh, this Amplicon sequencing approach for several hundred samples associated with the Delta variant. We've shown we get pretty good detection sensitivity, uh, a couple thousand viruses, or sorry, uh, about 20 or 30,000 viruses in a sampler with our sensitivity down to about 1,000 viruses. This is in one of these passive sampling devices. To put this into perspective, outside of the current period where, the, where we've had large, you know, sort of 1,000 cases a day in Victoria, for the vast bulk of the pandemic, very, very, very few of our wastewater positive detections were detectable at, um, at this level, 1,000 viruses or less per sample. These days, it's, it's much more up in this range. The point being, this method works quite well for most uh, detections that we get at the levels we're currently seeing. We've developed a few different assays. We've got um, an assay that targets this uh, mutation, oops, that's a typo, that should be 474, uh, this mutation that's associated with the Delta variant and allows us to specifically detect that. And then you can use uh, this in parallel with some different controls, one that targets the virus and one that uses an internal standard. And the take home message from these target specific assays is that they're, they're, they're much more sensitive. Uh, this one's about uh, doubly as sensitive as that sort of broad spectrum approach of um, amplifying uh, a region of the, the spike protein and sequencing it. Um, we then added an additional uh, uh, assay for the Delta variant that targets a slightly different region of this uh, nucleocapsid gene, um, and, and we get uh, vastly improved sensitivity beyond that. So we can now detect samples at quite trace levels and quantify them and characterize them as the Delta variant. Now, of course, at the moment, just about everything is the Delta variant. So this is more of a proof of principle that it works rather than um, an assay that in and of itself is going to be of um, widespread use. Um, the next step is to now develop and um, improve these assays to then use them to detect the Omicron variant and the new variants as they emerge. Um, we're in the process of doing that now. So to summarize the variant detection work um, and then to move on to the last component of, of, my, of my presentation before I finish, um, we've developed a couple different assays in parallel that are now ready uh, and beginning to be used, um, particularly at the initial stages, focusing on major ports of entry and a few other things I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. Uh, one of them is a, is a sort of broad, um, broad spectrum approach. Uh, that's a type of, sorry, that should be 500 to 1,000 that allows detection of between 500 and 1,000 viral uh, genomes within um, within a wastewater sample. And as the advantage that this approach should presently be able to detect any known viral variant, um, which means it could be used on a, on, on a broad spectrum rather than in a, in a really targeted way for, for discovery, emerging, discovery of emerging variants as they become known um, based on clinical uh, testing without having to then rapidly redesign the test and re-optimize it and, and ensure that it's still working and so on. The downside of the approach is it's not as sensitive as some of these other methods that we've been working on. The further downside of the approach comes back to the initial issue that we had with the routine monitoring program, which is just the time frame. To, to use this particular assay, by the time you get a sample, it takes about 48 to 72 hours before you can have a result back to the Department of Health. And then and for, a, for a, a, a variant that potentially moves as fast as the Omicron variant might, um, that's just not good enough. So we're trying to improve that. But then the next step is to then focus on these target specific assays, develop one specifically for the Omicron uh, variant, which we're doing now. Um, and should hopefully have ready uh, within the next week. And that'll allow us to then have that kind of same day turnaround that you really need to be able to use this um, in a routine way. If we then look at how that'll be implemented and how it is being implemented, so a lot of this work is going to focus on passive sampling devices again, and these can be rolled out at a variety of different sites, depending on how the Omicron variant and other variants emerge and spread and how um, important they prove to be as we gain a better understanding of them. In the initial stages, while at present we don't have um, current evidence of the Omicron variant circulating within the community, there's been, I think, now five cases of Omicron detected in returning travelers in New South Wales, but to my knowledge, none that are associated directly with transmission within the community itself. 
um, this method, these methods will be used at airports and at the, the, the few remaining quarantine hotels. And then if the hotel quarantine program gets expanded again, then the additional quarantine hotels uh, to look at entry of, the, of this viral variant into, into the area. Um, I'm focusing mostly on Victoria, but I'm speaking on uh, Thursday with um, a number of members of the Department of Health at each of the states across Australia and, um, and other members of the Colossus program to expand this uh, beyond just, just Victoria. Um, in addition to that, as the depending again on how the knowledge of the Omicron variant evolves um, and how serious it proves to be and how significant it proves to be, and then the potential that it, it may uh, sort of reignite some of the, the, the worst parts of the pandemic, um, then there's also plans to start to use these passive samplers at um, high risk sites, again, hospitals, aged care facilities, large construction sites or other sorts of industry sites where you either have a lot of people in close contact with the potential for, for large clusters to form through direct contact, um, meat packing and processing plants and, and various other places where people are kind of in tight spaces, there's a potential risk there. Um, and then uh, schools as well, especially if, um, and depending on, on information, again, on the Omicron variant, if it, if it proves to transmit more readily in younger, in younger kids. And then again, depending on how things progress, then it may potentially eventually, hopefully not, but may eventually then roll out to being used routinely across the entire sampling network to gain an understanding of where clusters might emerge to try and identify them and get on top of them and, and, and reduce and limit their spread. Okay, so, I've got about three more minutes left in my sort of uh, ideal time. I've got about uh, two or three slides to go, so I should be, I should be fine. Um, so the last phase of the program I wanted to briefly touch on was the next sort of an additional uh, arm of technology that can be used in assisting uh, the, uh, or providing additional value in wastewater testing and assisting sort of matching up wastewater detections with what's happening in the community and in clinical samples. And this involves sequencing the entire viral genome from wastewater. And then using that genomic information to try and match up the variants that have been detected in wastewater with the variants that are circulating within clinical testing and having their genome sequences uh, determined <clears throat> and seeing if you can then try and link up and identify the actual source of a cluster and confirm that it, it's the person that you've identified and so on. Now your capacity to do that base, it, it is basically related to just how many different viral variants there are circulating in the community. If everything is one viral variant, the Delta variant, um, for example, then your ability to link those, those wastewater detections with clinical uh, sampling is, is, is fairly limited. Um, and we experienced that, for example, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, last year in Victoria when we had our first major um, uh, infection wave where all of those uh, initial infections were, were spawned from a very small number of cases that escaped from hotel quarantine. And so basically everyone was getting infected with pretty much the exact same identical viral uh, uh, variant of viral lineage. So your ability to then match a, sample, a given wastewater sample up to a clinical sample was basically non-existent. Um, as the pandemic progresses, as our borders begin to open and we begin to expect to see a greater number of viral variants circulating in, within Australia, then uh, these sorts of tools may become more valuable. Um, conceptually, there are a variety of different ways in which you can undertake genome sequencing. One of the biggest obstacles is purely an issue of sensitivity. Genome sequencing methods are very powerful, but they don't have the sensitivity of these other diagnostic methods that I mentioned. In very brief, um, the two kind of or three major approaches you can use. Number one, you can try and, and purify the viruses very cleanly from a wastewater sample so that all you have is viral material. Um, there's some potential approaches that this might work for uh, based on, on, on other sorts of, of work that's been done on purifying um, various different parasites, for example, from, from fecal samples. That includes uh, developing specific antibodies that target spike protein, sticking that onto a magnetic, a, a microscopic magnetic bead, um, and then using a magnet to specifically fish those viruses out of solution. Um, there's not presently a diagnostic tool that does this. Uh, there is um, a company in China called Sino Biological, Biological that's produced this uh, antibody-based magnetic bead for spike protein, but at present, uh, that's not licensed for sale outside of China, and it's not available. So instead, what we have to try and do is find a way to specifically amplify the viral genome from solution and then sequence it. And the most commonly used method is this method called the Arctic method, or a variation that called Chiasi. And this basically uses a bunch of PCR reactions, the same sort of basic strategy as our diagnostic approach, but it tiles across the entire genome and generates a whole bunch of these little fragments and then tries to sequence those. The other approach is to use a variation on that, which is using baits, um, but I won't touch on that. 
So we've been pursuing that uh, first method, the um, the Arctic method, um, other or sorry, Kaiosik method. Uh, the, there are other examples around the world of studies that have been published that have used this. They've shown proof in principle that it works. They've shown that the mutations that you identify in these sequences are uh, consistent with the viral variants that are circulating in the local community and can be used uh, uh, to basically link up to, to variants that, that you know are present. Um, they give reasonably good performance uh, at, a, at a reasonable level of sensitivity uh, within the context of the sorts of um, of um, viral loads that are circulating in the communities where they've been tried. Particularly, they've been used mostly in the United States and in Europe, where of course, unfortunately, they have much more, unfortunately for them, obviously, uh, we're fortunate for us that we don't have those levels of viral infection, but unfortunately for them, they have they have much higher uh, viral loads than, than, uh, than we do, uh, and that means that they can use these sorts of tools. Um, we tried to apply these methods in Australia, and up until a few months ago, um, really within Victoria, the levels of virus material that we were getting was not enough to make this possible. Um, that now is, is both through improving the methods and also through um, increased rates of transmission from the Delta variant no longer the case, so we can really use this. Uh, when they worked, they worked well. This was an example of a, of a sample that was um, uh, detected in wastewater uh, in Australia probably, I think, about eight months ago or so. Um, and by doing the sequencing, even in this case where we only got partial um, coverage, this is a schematic representation of viral genome. This little blue wavy line here shows uh, regions of the genome that have been sequenced and then the larger the number, the basically the larger the redundancy of sequencing we've had and where you see just nothing, that means we weren't able to capture that part of the genome. So despite having patchy coverage of the genome in that initial experiment, we were able to identify a number of mutations within some of these key genes, including the spike protein gene. And then we could match those mutations up to uh, websites like the Next Strain website that I mentioned. We could identify a number of mutations that were present. And when we took these four mutations, for example, collectively, uh, we were actually able to show that there was a known viral variant that had this specific com combination of mutations. And that was one that was called the IOTA variant, which was not, not circulating anymore, but was circulating uh, around that time. Uh, sorry, this was actually late 2020. Um, and, and had some evidence that it was able to escape vaccine uh, or, or antibody detection. Um, in this case, we think this was actually likely to be uh, fragments from a, from a recent traveler and, and the department was able to track down the most likely source of that. But it just shows the kind of power of these tools. We've since broadened that program and we now um, uh, been using that uh, much more routinely recently. We've sequenced about 20 or 30 genomes now, but we're expanding that to many hundreds. Um, presently, it works quite well. Um, it has been quite successful in identifying the viral variants. At the moment, uh, everything we've been detecting is Delta, um, the Delta variant, but, um, but nonetheless, these tools are not in place. So finally, with my concluding slide, um, within the routine uh, wastewater surveillance program that we developed, that proved to be a highly sensitive, specific and accurate method. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been noted by the Department of Health as being incredibly important in their um, public health response. And of course, that's not just my group that's involved in that, that, it, that it is many, many groups across Victoria and around Australia that I'll, that I'll acknowledge at the end. But it has proved that this method can be quite useful and, and very valuable. One of the challenges going forward with routine mo uh, monitoring is kind of adjusting to, in air quotes, the new normal, which is, as I said, um, Previously, the, the circumstances in Australia were, was one where we had quite low levels of viruses um, in the environment and, and detecting virus in wastewater was a relatively rare event such that you could use it to identify <clears throat> new clusters. Uh, this is today's map of the same, excuse me, my voice is starting to fray. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This same map from the Department of Health website today uh, all the red dots are places where there's a detection within the last sampling period. So the challenge is now you're no longer looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for a specific needle amidst a pile of other very similar looking needles. And that's going to present some real challenges in terms of how these programs get used. The variant detection work is now underway and working well for the these uh, Delta and the Delta Plus variant. Um, we're within about the next week, we should have an assay that works well for the Omicron variant. We hope it looks like it should work. Um, and that, bro that surveillance program is, is beginning to roll out now. Um, and then the whole genome program, sequencing program is, is working, it's available, and it, it's part of the ongoing work that we do. So with that, um, I'll finish. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge an enormous number of people that have contributed to this work. Um, obviously within my team, I've had a really fantastic group of people that have spent 
uh, quite long hours, both doing the, 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 the monitoring work and then also developing up these uh, tools. Um, and it's been uh, really fantastic to see the contributions that, they, that they've made. And I know they've really, um, they've really uh, uh, enjoyed being part of the program. A number of people within WeHi that have contributed to the program, of course, uh, two of our major contacts are Department of Health, uh, uh, Rachel Kuhn and Monica Nolan, Dave for his fantastic work on the passive samplers, many other players within Melbourne Water and SE Water that have provided uh, a lot of advice and, and, and played really important roles in, uh, in developing these programs um, across the country as well, within South Australia, for example, uh, within New South Wales, uh, our colleagues at the Peter Doherty Institute and, and Water Research Australia and many, many others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think we've got some, if anyone has any questions for Aaron, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and we have some already. Um, from Monica, what was the number or proportion of false negatives in the wastewater testing? Um, that's a good question. So there's not really any way for us to measure false negatives because the problem is um, we are using the most sensitive tool that we have. So if we miss a virus, um, there's no way for us to know that. Um, from a uh, 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 public health perspective, um, we've erred on the side of trying to detect everything we possibly can, um, but, but there will be a limit to detection that we just don't have the capacity to measure. And unfortunately, that's where we're at. We, we can't measure below the tools that we have to be able to say. <clears throat> and um, do you expect whole genome testing to play a greater role in the future as it becomes more widely used? I think it will, especially if, it, if it, I mean, it kind of is a bit of forecasting of what's going to happen with the pandemic over the next 12 months. And of course, uh, nobody knows that and certainly not me. Um, but I think one, you know, I could predict that the most likely thing we'll see is over at least the early stages of next year, as we increase, um, uh, the, increasingly open the borders uh, for the country and, and increasingly kind of learn to, I guess, for lack of a better term, learn to kind of live with low level transmission, obviously, when we have higher rates of vaccination and everything else, um, one, you'd expect that there will be a lot more variety of viral variants that will be circulating. And there, I think, in particular, the genome sequencing approaches would be quite valuable. And last one, where can we go to learn more about this project and similar ones from around the world? Is there yes. a website? Yep, that's a good question. So the Colossus program, there's a website on, um, on uh, the Water Research Australia uh, web, uh, the, their site. So if you search Colossus, the important thing there is it's not spelt the normal way. It's uh, C-O-L-O-S-S-O-S, -S -S not U-S. Um, there's quite a bit of information in the program there. Uh, Department of Health has, the Victorian Department of Health has um, a website that talks about the Waste Monitor Monitoring Program. Uh, in and of itself. Uh, beyond that, if you're interested in um, wastewater programs around the world, probably your best place to look, there's not one spot that's kind of kind of collates it all, uh, but is to look on um, websites like Google Scholar and look at what people are publishing. Um, and that's kind of your best resource. There's not really one specific uh, community resource that kind of brings all of this together. But um, most of the programs have websites that you can find if you do go to Google for wastewater and COVID or something, you'll find them too. And on the, the topic, I guess, of global collaboration, I assume that, um, are you still first testing for the presence of um, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and then going and looking for the specific variants? Or are you now going straight out and looking for the variants themselves? No, it's the first. So it's still the, the case that the, the, the front line of the program is the routine testing. And then where a sample is detected as being positive for the virus, then that sample will get sent to my lab for doing the variant detection work, at least within Victoria at the moment. Um, the reason for that is uh, one of capacity. So th there's many thousands of samples being tested and, and, and my lab is a research lab. Um, so it's ALS in, in Victoria, for example, that has the capacity to do that large scale surveillance. Um, we just don't. So that's, that's why that gets done. And, and I should not just say that. They're also experts in doing those diagnostic services, and that's what they're really strong at. So it makes sense for them to do it. And then is, is that also how it's happening in, in other countries around the world as well, that they're doing just a generic test for the presence of, of COVID and then looking for the specific variants? Yeah, that's a good question. It varies. 
Um, so I think the variant detection work is at different levels of development in different areas of the world. I think most of them would probably still be doing the same kind of frontline uh, uh, conventional diagnostic because it's the most efficient. It, there, it, there's a bit more involved processes to go into to do the variant detection work. So you want to do that only on samples that you know contain virus to kind of cut down the workload. Um, I do know that the United Kingdom, for example, has widespread variant detection programs and they've got that rolled out across the country or series of countries in the case of the UK. Um, the European Union is developing it, but I don't know the exact status of those programs uh, at this point. I'm just gonna keep asking questions. Sure. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot. Um, so, and the sequencing that you're doing, is that the Illumina short read? And are you thinking about going to long read so that you can, do, do you need to go to long read? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we are focused mostly on the short read sequencing approaches. And the primary reason for that is because we've mostly um, uh, focused our methods on, on developing methods that are the most sensitive. And um, it tends to be much easier to sensitively amplify small pieces of, of genomes rather than large pieces. Um, you just lose efficiency and sensitivity as a consequence of that. And so we focused on, on, on generating small, small pieces. Where I think it might be necessary to start to use those longer sequencing technologies and try and generate longer fragments of, of the virus RNA is particularly when we start to want to unpick um, a variety of viral variants that are circulating in the community and are detected uh, together within an individual sample. So where you want to try and basically say, okay, I've got a number of different mutations on these little reef fragments, but how do I basically pull that apart and work out which one belongs to what genome and how that, what that means in terms of the different viral variants that are present. Um, and there you want longer pieces of, our, uh, of sequence because you then have multiple mutations on the same piece of DNA that you know belong to the same virus and just makes that process of identifying those more minor variants uh, just that much more feasible. So I think that's where we would probably look to start expanding into some of those longer technology, longer new technologies. But the sensitivity issue is, is a challenge on that. And uh, one final question from me. Um, are you getting quicker at creating the tests to find the different variants? Yep. Yes, we are. Um, partly because we're getting pretty good experience on um, what a good test looks like. Um, partly because we don't have to kind of do all the background, like just working out the, because you know, there's, there are many hundreds of, of, of biomedical companies that produce the types of um, uh, reagents that you use in these tests, and they don't all perform exactly the same way in every situation. So part of the initial setup is just trying to work out the optimal method. Once you kind of have that, then just adjusting it to detect a slightly different mutation is, is you know, it's, you've got 90% of the job already done. Um, that's part of it. The other part is that we, we um, are actively compiling um, information on emerging variants and, and sort of scanning the literature and scanning sites like the Next Strain site and some of the others um, for the emergency new variants and trying to kind of pre-predict which ones we think, basically trying to virtually design the assays that we need and then have them ready to order as soon as it proves that they, okay, these ones, this is one we need to be, we need to be kind of aware of, and then we start to work. So we're kind of getting better at both of those things for sure. Okay, great. Um, I don't think there's been any more questions coming into the Q and A, so it's just as well I had lots. Thank <laughs> you very much for a very interesting talk. And um, this talk will also be available later on the AMC YouTube, and um, I'm gonna force my year 10 son to sit and watch it to see if he can understand it. Good. <laughs> Very much. Okay, that's fantastic. And um, I, I think you have my email address. If anyone else on the on the call uh, wants to contact me for any reason, I'm more than happy for you to forward my uh, my email address onto them. Great. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I really appreciate it, and it's been a lot of fun. And I hope um, I hope others enjoyed it. It's um, yeah, it's uh, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you.